So here we're going to have a look at an example of how we can use infrared spectroscopy to help us identify a, a chemical compound. So this is going to be a qualitative example. However, we can also use infrared spectroscopy for quantitative analysis. And with quantitative analysis of infrared spectroscopy, the same as for column chromatography and for UV visible spectroscopy, we're going to use the idea that absorbance is proportional to concentration. And if absorbance is proportional to concentration, then transmittance will be inversely proportional to concentration. So if we want to analyze quantitatively using infrared spectroscopy, we use that idea and we run standards and, and we do everything else the same way as we did for UV visible spectroscopy and for column chromatography. And we can get concentrations of compounds of solutions. However, here we're going to analyze something qualitatively. So here we've got an unknown compound. We've got the infrared spectra of an unknown compound. And we want to identify the major functional group. Down here we have some data. So we have the wave numbers that get absorbed, the ranges of wave numbers that are absorbed by different bonds. And so if we if we have, if we see a trough, for example, at a wave number of around 800, then that suggests that there is a carbon-carbon bond in our unknown molecule. So here we've got four peaks on our spectrum. We've got one here, two here, three here, and four here. Now, our first peak is between a wavelength, between a wave number, sorry, of about uh, 700 and 1,000. And so that can show us that's the only, the only bond that would absorb infrared radiation in that wave number uh, is a carbon-carbon bond. And so that uh, trough number one is caused by a carbon carbon bond. Now trough number two, it's got a wave, is, a, is at a wave number of just over a thousand, about 1100. And it's a bit, because it's a, quite a distinct peak to peak, it's quite, because tr trough number two is distinct from trough number one, we can tell that it's been caused by a different bond to, to trough number one. And so peak number two has not been caused by a CC bond. And so here we can see that uh, the wave number of, of Trough number two fits well into the range for a carbon-oxygen bond. So we can see that trough number two is caused by a carbon-oxygen bond. Now trough number three is a little bit more ambiguous. Trough number three occurs at a wavelength of about uh, 2800 or 2900 and goes to just over th a wave number, sorry, of 2700, 2800 and goes to a wave number of just over 3000. Now this could have been caused by an OH bond in an as in an acidic oxygen hydrogen bond or a carbon hydrogen bond. Now here is where we have to use our skills of deduction a little bit. So we know that if we have an acidic oxygen hydrogen bond present, we're almost always going to have a, a carbon oxygen double bond present as part of the carboxyl functional group. However, we can see that there is no trough in the wave number range of a carbon oxygen double bond and so it's unlikely that there's going to be an acidic oxygen hydrogen bond in our molecule. Also, the fact that the trough is is a bit at a is at a much higher wave number. It fits within the range of just within the range of the carbon hydrogen uh, bond suggests that maybe it is a little bit again more likely to be the carbon hydrogen bond. So we can be fairly confident as a result of that that trough number three is caused by a carbon hydrogen bond. But we can't be certain, but we can be fairly confident purely based on the fact, if it, more than anything, that there is no carbon-oxygen double bond here. Now trough number four occurs at a wave number of about 3200, 3300. We can see that that fits well into the range of this, this uh, hydroxyl functional group, this alcohol, this al alcoholic oxygen hydrogen. And that, again, that sort of validates uh, our, our analysis and our discovery of a carbon-oxygen bond because we know that uh, in, in a lot of cases, if we've got a hydroxyl, fun a hydroxyl functional group, it's going to look a little something like that. So we'll have, if we have, often if we have an alcoholic OH bond, it's often going to be uh, accompanied by a carbon-oxygen bond. So that gives us extra confidence that we are on the right track. So we've got, we've analysed and sort of identified the bonds that cause these four troughs. So let's have a look at the structure or the likely structure of our unknown compound. Now we know from the get-go that we've got more than one carbon, which can be, which is a little bit useful, but not extremely useful. It certainly doesn't tell us about our functional group, but we've got a carbon-carbon bond in here somewhere. 
Now we know we've got a carbon oxygen bond and an oxygen hydrogen bond. So we can be pretty certain that this is a, a hydroxyl functional group, which is our major functional group. So we're pretty sure that our compound that we're dealing with is an alcohol. Now we've got carbon hydrogen bond. Now that really doesn't surprise us now that we look at this. This was the one that was a bit ambiguous, but we know that if there are two uh, Two, two carbons bonded to, together, then we're very, very likely to have a carbon-hydrogen bond. In fact, for any organic molecule, we're extremely likely to have a carbon-hydrogen bond. So, probably looks a little something like that. Now, so we've, we've got these, these four bonds then. We've drawn these four bonds into our molecular structure. So, we know that our unknown compound has a hydroxyl functional group. It's an alcohol. And we know that there is it has more than one carbon and thus it is not methanol. Now that is about all we can tell. So we know it's a, we know it's an alcohol. It could could you know go on for a very long time. There could be you know another 20 or 30 carbons or it could end there and we could be dealing simply with ethanol. And so we could be dealing with something like that. However, we know that we're pretty certain that there are no other functional groups on here because we've identified the bonds that caused all of these troughs and we thus we can see that there are no other functional groups in our molecule. So we know that we've just got a plain and simple alcohol here. We're not sure of its length. It could similarly extend both in both ways like this. And so on and on. But we know that we've got a hydroxyl functional group, we've got an alcohol, and we've got more than one carbon. So that is how we can analyze. That's how we use an infrared spectra combined with some extra data to analyze and identify parts of the structure and sort of get a really good idea about the structure of an unknown compound.